hurricanes. Gargantuan forces of nature that tear apart coastal regions from the Caribbean islands to the Gulf and Atlantic coast of the United States. Since 1950, hurricanes have received names and ratings to help classify them and keep record of their destructive power. However, one of the most powerful to ever touch the continent only has a retroactive rating of Category 5, the highest possible rating, and remains unnamed. Known as the 1935 Labor Day Hurricane, this small but deadly storm tore the key islands of Florida asunder in the late summer of 1935. August 31st, 1935, a tropical depression appears near the southern Bahamas, rapidly strengthening before barreling down on the Florida Keys, which lie roughly 400 miles to the west. As the hurricane inched closer to the eastern edge of the Keys, American-born but aviation corps of the Cuban Army pilot Leonard Povey performed the first known flyby of a hurricane, liking to not fly into the storm as his plane did not have a canopy. What he saw was what would become potentially the strongest hurricane at landfall in recorded U.S. history. If you've ever seen TV coverage of hurricanes, I'm sure that you've heard the meteorologists refer to the barometric pressure and that the lower it is, the stronger the hurricane. Air pressure is measured using a barometer, a device consisting of a glass tube filled with mercury. When the mercury rises in the tube, the barometric pressure is higher, leading to generally pleasant weather with clear skies. When the mercury falls lower in the tube, this shows that the pressure is lower, indicating the likely presence of clouds and storms which potentially lead to strong winds and precipitation as the air tries to rise into the atmosphere. Air pressure at sea level is usually a little over 1,000 millibars. Lower pressure readings indicate that the air is rising, and extremely low readings indicate the presence of violent surface level winds. Hurricanes today have their pressure measured both at sea and upon landfall, with Hurricane Wilma in 2005 displaying the record low for at-sea barometric pressure with a staggering 882 millibars. These numbers typically rise as the hurricane reaches land, as the storm no longer has as much energy from the warm waters to fuel it. The Labor Day hurricane, however, was only measured upon landfall and reached a verified low pressure reading of 892 millibars, only 10 millibars higher than Wilma, and the third lowest ever recorded at land or sea, despite the fact that it had likely already weakened from its approach towards land. I say verified because one captain claimed he observed a reading of 880 millibars before losing his barometer to the sea. The Labor Day hurricane approaching the residents of the central Florida Keys was likely the strongest storm to ever make landfall in the United States. Hurricane warnings were issued for southern Florida, with evacuation via the railroad system that connected the Keys being used to transport both civilians and World War I veterans who were in the Keys building infrastructure to create the overseas highway. Trains moved citizens on the 1st and 2nd of September up through the Keys and onto mainland Florida. However, many elected not to leave and would rather ride out the storm. The hurricane made landfall in the afternoon and late evening of the 2nd of September. The sea became rough as barometers started to show a pressure drop, and as the sun drew closer to setting, those who remained in the path would experience some of the most violent winds the state of Florida has ever been subjected to. Sustained winds are estimated to have been around 185 miles per hour based on the wind speeds of other hurricanes with similar barometric pressure readings, as well as significant damage to a lighthouse lens over 130 feet above sea level indicating the presence of winds approaching 200 miles per hour. Some of the damage, including to the previously mentioned Alligator Reef Lighthouse, even suggests gusts exceeding 200 miles per hour. Weather Bureau Cooperator J.E. Duane was the head of a fish camp on Long Key, one of the areas which the eye passed directly over. The National Weather Service has the following log of Duane's experience on their website, detailing what the Keys experienced over those few terrifying hours. September 2nd, 2 p.m. Barometer falling. Heavy sea swell and a high tide. Heavy rain squalls continue. Wind from north or north-northeast, 4-6. 3 p.m. Ocean swells had changed. This change noted was that large waves were rolling in from southeast, somewhat against winds which were still in north or northeast. 4 p.m. Wind still north, increasing to force 9 barometer dropping 0 0.01 every five minutes. Rain continues. 5 p.m. Wind north, hurricane force, swells from the southeast. 6 p.m. Barometer 28.04, still falling, heavy rains. Wind still north, hurricane force and increasing. Water rising on north side of the island. 6.45 p.m. 
barometer 27.90, wind backing to northwest, increasing, plenty of flying timbers, and heavy timber too. Seemed it made no difference as to weight and size. A beam 6 by 8 inches, about 18 feet long, was blown from north side of camp, about 300 yards, through observer's house, wrecking it and nearly striking three persons. Water 3 feet deep from top of railroad grade, were about 16 feet. 7 p.m. We were now located in main lodge building of camp. Flying timbers had begun to wreck this lodge, and it was shaking on every blast. Water had now reached level of railway on north side of camp. 9 p.m. No signs of storm letting up. Barometer still falling very fast. 9.20 p.m. Barometer 27.22 inches. Wind abated. We now heard other noises than the wind and new center of storm was over us. We now head for the last and only cottage that I think can or will stand the blow due to arrive shortly. All hands, 20 in number, gather in this cottage. During this lull, the sky is clear to the north, stars shining brightly and a very light breeze continued, no flat calm. About the middle of the lull, which lasted a timed 55 minutes, the sea began to lift up it seemed and rise very fast. This from ocean side of camp. I put my flashlight out on the sea and could see walls of water which seemed many feet high. I had to race fast to regain entrance of the cottage, but water caught me waist deep. Although the rider was only about 60 feet from doorway of cottage, water lifted cottage from its foundation, and it floated. 10.10 p.m. Barometer now 27.02 inches, wind beginning to blow from south-southwest. 10.15 p.m. First blast from the south-southwest, full force. House now breaking up. Wind seemed stronger than any time during the storm. I glanced at the barometer, which read 26.98 inches, dropped it in the water, and was blown outside into the sea. Got hung up in the broken fronds of coconut tree and hung on for dear life. I was then struck by some object and knocked unconscious. September 3rd, 2.25 p.m. I became conscious in a tree and found I was lodged about 20 feet above the ground. All water had disappeared from the island. The cottage had been blown back on the island, and once the sea receded and left with it all people safe. Hurricane force winds continued till 5 a.m., and during this period, terrific lightning flashes were seen. After 5 a.m., strong gales continued throughout the day with very heavy rain. By luck, or perhaps the grace of God, Dwayne and his 20 companions all survived the night in the ruins of the Long Key Fish Camp. When Dwayne and the other survivors across the Keys were able to get their bearings and investigate the damage elsewhere, they would see widespread catastrophic damage to both life and property. Where there once had been businesses and homes, there was nothing but mangled debris and sand. The heads of severed palms littered a graveyard of timber. A combination of 200 mile per hour winds and a storm surge approaching 20 feet had ravaged the central Keys. To call it total devastation would be an understatement. Bodies were found without clothes, swept off in the storm. Some unfortunate souls would be rendered unrecognizable, their skin sandblasted due to prolonged exposure to the winds. Up to this point, the keys were connected by a series of railroad bridges spanning the island communities, but construction on a highway meant to run alongside the railroad system was actually the reason for so many World War I veterans to be present in the area, as they were contracted to build all this infrastructure. Unfortunately for them, working on this project would be the reason for many of their deaths. Over 200 veterans working on the project would lose their lives in the tempest that occurred on the Labor Day of 1935, with civilian loss totaling around 200 fatalities as well. Estimates on the total fatalities are around 409, according to the Red Cross. However, as is the case with many tropical storms, the exact death toll is unknown. The final evacuation train that had attempted to leave the Keys the previous evening was derailed and left its passengers stranded to face the fury of the storm. Miraculously, every single passenger was able to find sufficient shelter and survive with minimal injuries. The 30 miles between Tavernier and Vaca Keys was the hardest hit with communities like Isla Morada and Matacumbe Key, among others, suffering catastrophic damage to businesses, hotels, and town centers. The Caribbean colony sheltered roughly 26 people during the storm. Only four survived, evidenced by a harrowing sight of a lone bathtub remaining where several buildings once stood. 
The relief effort was made all the more difficult by the near total destruction of the rail system that was the sole terrestrial method of travel throughout the Keys, and boats were now the main method of transport for the injured and volunteers. Damage to the railway was so extensive that rebuilding was determined to be a waste of time and money, and the plan to construct a highway was transformed into a replacement for the railroad system. That same system of highways can still be seen today in the Keys. Evidence of the previous rail system can also be found across various parts of the islands. In many ways, this disaster shaped what the Keys would become. But no matter how powerful this storm was, it could not destroy the natural beauty that makes this coastal paradise so special. I know this video has certainly been very heavy for me to make and talk about. And to bring a little positivity, I wanted to talk some more about the positives of the affected area and show how wonderfully it has recovered in the 90 years since the storm. As the southernmost point in the contiguous United States, the Florida Keys contain some of the most beautiful sights on the American continent. Abundant exotic wildlife, crystal clear blue waters, and clean, sandy beaches rivaling any coastline in the world. Isla Mirada is considered the premier sport fishing destination, where its unique geographical location means the waters are full of exotic tropical fish. Temperatures are toasty year-round, and the area has something for all visitors from nature to nightlife. You would be hard-pressed to find someone who wouldn't enjoy their time here. It's touching to know that the people who lost loved ones and property in the 1935 storm did not allow the area to fall into ruin, and their hard work and sacrifice to rebuild these beautiful islands should be commended. It's okay to be fascinated by strong storms, but I believe the greater purpose of talking about natural disasters is to make sure that these stories are told in a way that is both respectful and conducive of showing the importance of the National Weather Service. If you have a loved one in the path of a hurricane, tornado, wildfire, or any other natural disaster that can be reasonably forecast, don't be scared to call them and tell them to take proper safety precautions for that disaster. You never know when your call could be the catalyst for a series of decisions that save their life. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and let me know any natural disasters that you'd like me to cover in the future. Thank you for watching.